Bennett is the featured back. Anders, the fullback. Bennett straight up the middle. Donnell Bennett to the Raider 36. Boy, I'll tell you, Kimball Anders, number 38, gets a sensational block, and that hole is there. Bennett. Touchdown. Donnell Bennett. Second effort, gets in for 12-yard touchdown, 21 to 3. Remember when it was a grinded out offense that Kansas City had? Kimball Anders, touchdown! Kimball Anders, touchdown, Chief. Second touchdown for Kimball Anders. Third down and seven from the 45. Straight drop by Gerbach, looks it out to Anders. Can he get the first down? Yes, and a lot more inside the 40. He's got one man to beat, fears across the right side, and Kimball Anders stretches for the touchdown. 55 yards. Welcome in to Four Minute Offense, everybody. I'm the monitor alongside Clint Schweitzer and the two stars of the show that are going to be with you all season long on Four Minute Offense. John L. Bennett, Kimball Anders. We have a very special show for you tonight. Last week, we had the Marty party celebrating Marty Schottenheimer's birthday. He would have been 78 years old. And tonight, we have another special show. We're going through the 1995 season. One of the best regular seasons in Kansas City Chiefs history. These guys finished 13 and 3. And Kimball, I'm going to throw it to you. We have a very special guest with us tonight. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, my teammate Tim Grunhoff for coming on the show. Appreciate you. And uh, congratulations again on going to the Chiefs uh, Wall of Fame. Well, thank you, Kimball. Donnell, it's good to, good to see you guys. I miss you guys. Uh, any day I get an opportunity to hang out with you guys for a couple minutes, it's a great day. I will tell you this, Kimball. I caught you on that screen. I just want to let you know that. I was right there with you stride for stride. And uh, I was glad that they put that on there. And uh, Noah and Clint, thank you for doing that because you showed that, that speed number 61. And, and I don't know what that says about you, Kimball, but uh, I was right there with you, brother. But, uh, boy, it was fun to watch Danell running people over. And, Kimball, you guys were such integral parts of my career. And it's so blessed to have an opportunity to block for you guys. So thank you once again, uh, you guys, for having me on, and especially my two backs. It's good to be here with you guys. Appreciate it. Well, first of all, I got to say, Kimba, you can't win for losing, bro. They changed the video to the dude catching you on the field. And then they put a new video there in the center that said, hey, I caught you on the screen. Bro, yeah. They really trying to say you're not that fast, bro. That's okay. Hey, it's hey, a win-win Kim situation, though. It's a win-win situation. Hey, yeah, Kimball yeah. was a receiver at, at, at Houston, and we will never sell him short on that speed, man. He, he can play any position on the field, and we know that. Oh, you, you I know tell that. Him. Hey, Donnell, you, you tell him, Clint. Just because I'm a lineman doesn't mean I'm slow. See, I was fast. I had that quickness and speed, man. That's, what, right, that, right. that's what I was saying. I wasn't saying that. That Kimball was slow. I was saying that I was fast. So uh, uh, listen, <laughs> I already know you was fast, bro. You you the <laughs> fastest person I know could get to a Mike linebacker in the history of football, bro. That's right. That's right. I, I'll tell you the one thing that I love being fast. The first one to be in there and congratulate you guys when you scored a touchdown because that meant I got to go sit down and drink some water on the sideline. That's cool. <laughs> well. <laughs> Guys, it's great to have this, and we're, we're talking about the 1995 season, kind of specifically here, um, as it's been 26 years uh, ago, not to date anybody, but um, I was 11 years old when that season kicked off, and, you know, we were all a little younger 26 years ago, but, you know, like Noah mentioned in the, in, at the onset the, at the time, 13-3, and three, you know, it sets the record for, uh, you know, wins in franchise history. Uh, it's one of the most memorable seasons for so many so many reasons, and we'll get into that, kind of some specifics. But kind of for you, Donnell, I want to ask you, because this is coming into your second season. You come in in the 94 draft class. It's got Greg Hill in it. 
Marcus Allen's already there. Kim Blayers is already there. This offensive line's been solidified. We know John Alt. We know Ricky Sigler, Tim Grunhard, you know, Dave Zott. And of course, Will Shields came in in 93. That line is set. But for you, Donnell, you're coming in. What, what is your kind of mindset coming into year two? The, the, the backfield, it's a crowded backfield room, man. And you're just trying to solidify yourself and kind of, you know, become a part of things, right? Well, besides being in awe with all those great football players you just named, um, I was coming off an injury. Uh, I tore my ACL, so I was trying to get back on the field as fast as I can, I could, man, because I wanted to be a part of it. And, and you know, my role for the first part of the season was to make sure the defense was ready on the scout team because, you know, I was on the, I think it's called a pup list or whatever for the first six games. And, and I wanted to show everybody that I was ready to play and back to being a hundred percent. So I took it upon myself to make sure that I was doing everything I could on the scout team to make sure that defense was ready, whoever we were playing. Yeah. And for Tim and Kimball, Donnell just mentioned he was on the pup list the first six weeks starting that season. What do you guys remember entering that 1995 season? Steve Bono is going to be the quarterback, the guy at the helm. You just got off of two years with Joe Montana. And now here comes Steve Bono. What were you thinking about the offense moving from Joe Montana to Steve Bono heading into 1995? Tim, we'll start with you. Yeah. You know what? We, we like you just named a stable of backs that were, I mean, outstanding. You know, we had a number of guys that could come into the huddle and make plays on the backfield. And, you know, we knew that uh, with Joe Montana being gone that we were going to have to maybe change up a little bit. So we went to more of a run-oriented offense and some play action. And uh, Bones did a really nice job of selling some of that play action and getting the ball down the field. But more importantly than that, when you looked at the huddle and you saw Kimball and, and, and you saw Donnell and you saw Marcus and you saw Greg and you saw those guys in the huddle, you know, you knew each one of them had a skill set and each of them had a specialty that they could do. And, um, you know, and, and I thought that uh, the offensive coordinator, I believe it, it was probably Hackett still at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think he did a really good job of being able to find what they did well and implement that into the game plan. So, you know, we first, our first 15 plays, you could almost look at it and say, OK, uh, Donnell will be in for this play. Marcus will be in for this play and uh, Kimball will be in for this play. And it just worked out. And there was no selfish, you know, people in that huddle. There was no people that were, you know, worried about getting their touches or no people worried about who's going to score, who's not going to score. I think the leader of that room was Marcus Allen and, and Kimball. And, and Donnell was a young guy and Greg was a young guy. And they learned a lot from the, the example that Marcus Allen taught those guys to do. And it was really a good, good locker room, especially the running back room. It was special. And we do welcome Greg Hill. You just mentioned him. We are welcoming him in. Greg, how's it going, man? We're we're grateful to have you here. We were just talking about what a crowding, crowded running back room that it was in 1995. Welcome in and would love to hear your thoughts, man. You come in uh, as a rookie with Donnell Bennett in 94, but 95, man, it's time to it's time to grow up and be a part of this offense, man. Uh, how's everybody doing, man? I ain't You're seen so great. many faces in a long time. I can probably see here like I I got to put my glasses on. <laughs> Greg, hey, we mentioned uh, it's been 26 years. Now we need some glasses, some of us. Now, I, okay, so is it okay if I put my glasses on? Because I, yeah. I, I can barely see these little You got Tim Grunhard. Oh, you got, you got Kimball. <laughs> look at that. Oh, look at the people on the – oh, my God. Oh. You got Grunny. You got Kimball. You got Donnell. Man. And that, that might be Chris Penn so right weird. there. That's we got Look Chris Penn. And there's Chris yeah. Penn right there. Yeah. So, What's up? It's a party <laughs> now, guys. Wow. Welcome in to both of you. And uh, well, uh, this is just, uh, this is tremendous. So, yeah, we're, we're, we're talking 95. Greg Hill, Chris Penn, welcome on in. Tim Grunhardt's here. You got Kim Anders. You got Donnell Bennett. You got Noah and I for whatever that's worth. But how's it going, guys? It's great to see both of you. This is great. You both look <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Hey, I'm just, I, you know what? I'll take over this whole show right now because I could just talk about the four men that I see on the screen and just tell some stories. I just don't know how deep we get to go with these stories. But <laughs> let, let, I, let me start with Tim Grunhart. Hey, I remember the first time I got to Kansas City, he was just such a mature man, you know, a Notre Dame guy. You know, I always wanted to go to Notre Dame or whatever, but it was just too cold up there. So I, I thought you had to have a special kind of skin. <laughs> on you to go play, uh, you know, to go play in that cold. But you know, those were those hard-nosed people. Like 
Tim Grunhardt is the actual epitome of what the definition would be of what an offensive lineman, a leader, a center would be in the NFL at that level. Mental smarts, physical smarts, take care of his body, leadership role, uh, for lack of a better way to say it, just a mean son of a gun, <laughs> which was necessary to do his job. Definitely. Yeah, okay. Bro. Definitely. And then, and then when you talk about Kimball, Kimball was probably you know ahead of his time because he was one of those silky smooth guys who was probably a double position type guy. He played the position of fullback, but you know he he, uh, he could have played the position of tailback just as easily in college at the University of Houston. He did play tailback a lot, and that's where his hands got developed because they threw the ball all day long, and they should have should have been able to run it a little bit more. And I kind of hated when I got to Kansas City because I thought I was going to be able to catch some passes. But when I see a guy like that who could line up actually in a slot receiver position today and probably catch a lot of passes, uh, a guy who lines up in the backfield and caught passes, and that got him to the Pro Bowl, uh, it, you know, it was, it was a phenomenal deal. Uh, that guy down there at the bottom, CP, Oh man, let me tell you a little bit about Chris Penn. We uh, when I was at a uh, and M, uh, here's a guy that comes in a silky smooth receiver could catch anything that you threw near him. Now I didn't say threw to him that you could throw throw near him. And I played him at a And M in like my second game that I ever started in college when I was a freshman. Uh, and I got had like 135 yards at the half. I didn't even play the second half. But CP did. That summer gun lit us ah. up that day, and that was the first time <laughs> that we had lost the game in, I mean, some years. Uh, he actually did. I think he had over 100 or maybe 200 yards receiving on the number one defense in the nation, which is what Texas A&M had, and just balled out and was just like a phenomenal athlete. And then – my boy Donnell Bennett. Uh, you know what, what? What? I don't know. We can't. We can't say profanity on the show, Kevin. <laughs> it was, you, it was, you okay. Be, okay. You hey, be. The first, hey, you know he was a U boy, a Miami boy. The first time I saw Donnell, it didn't take him fifteen seconds to say, "G Hill, we gonna hit stick and bust dick." <laughs> you know was, yeah. <laughs> was a tough guy. Uh, I actually felt like. <sighs> Kansas City was probably in a position to uh, – that they did a really good job of putting a squad together that probably just had some missing pieces. Um, you know, Donnell Bennett might have been – the he was the prototypical fullback. He was just a mean, nasty, good-looking, smooth, down-for-you type of brother would give you the shirt off his back, but would be the first one to say, hey, if you need to go in a dark alley, let me go with you. Not, hey, I, if you need me, ask me. Hey, let me go with you. He'd ask you first. So, you know, we, we it was just a, it was a special deal with that draft class. And, you know, to have guys like Kimball and Marcus, and I finally get a chance to say it. I did not you – know, I know people would always put me against Marcus, and I would be – you know, it would seem like I was upset or whatever. I was just real super competitive. I just came from a situation where in college, you know, I got to carry the ball all the time. You get to the one yard line, you get the two yard line. I'm get to get the ball in. I get to Kansas City. If I got to the ball, if I got the ball to the 10 yard line, I was got there smoking ass hot because I knew it was <laughs> time for me to go to the sideline. And I oh, yeah. Score that touchdown. <laughs> yeah, and you it was forget about like, that. Yeah, yeah, you can forget about it. And I, and I it was like, that. Man, that was the way that you feed a running back. But, you know, there, there was much respect for who we had there. And, you know, uh, Tony Richardson, you know, wonderful guy. But, you know, I, I, I think, you know, the guys that you have on the phone, when you talk about a guy named CP, you talk about Lake Dawson that was there. You talk about guys like Tim Grunhard that, that led an offensive line with, I mean, they can say whatever they say for the first, I think it was two to three years, and you guys could correct me, me and Marcus together, if you added our yards together, we led the league in rushing. And it was because of that offensive line that we had with Will Shields, guys like that, Tim Grunhard, who were mainstays in a scenario like that. And, and uh, even with Joe Montana, I remember one time he called a play in the huddle. And I didn't uh, – I was supposed to go wider on when he handed me the ball off. The got done playbook was too hard. We used to run all this trick stuff and try to fool everybody. And then got done, we get out of training camp, and then we only run 12 pages of the got done 250 page playbook. Used to piss me off. Like, why are we practicing all these got done plays? But then when we get to the season, we gonna we gonna look at 21 pages of work. 
Like I didn't understand all that. Like my brain didn't work that way. And I, I had a learning curve here. Yeah. So bro, I was really getting the ball. Hold on, let me G here. Hold on, bro. You you hold on, bro. You can't just take over the show. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> bro, we got to tell you. Let 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 Chris be tell us more. Yeah, I told you I could. It was time out for you. Let me finish the show. Bro, let's talk. Y'all appreciate this. I don't know if y'all knew this. Tim, Timmy, uh, uh, I don't know if Tim Grunhard remembers, but so I took the ball and I went right inside on Joe and I got like three yards on the play, but the play was designed to go further outside, outside of the tackle. So we went three and out and we go into the sideline and what was our offensive coordinator's name then? What was his name? Paul, Paul Hackett. Hackett. Paul, ha Paul Hackett was hollering from the sideline like, Greg Hill. Where the hell are you going? Where the hell are you running at? Right. And so I'm about to answer him. And and Joe Money answered the question first. He said, Man, shut the hell up and stand on the sideline and call the plays. He went where he was supposed to go. And so uh I was like, oh man, Joe Montana just stood up for me. You know, I was pretty good, right? We get to the sideline and I'm drinking some water, and Joe come over to me. He said, Hey man. If you don't get your fucking ass in that damn playbook, I don't know what else I got to tell you, man. I can't keep doing this for you. Like, that's what he really said. Yeah. Like, he, but he was that type of guy. So, I mean, it, the experience of being with the gentleman that are on this phone, uh, I, I mean, I, I, it was an absolute honor, pleasure. It's one of the best times I've ever had in my life. I remember DT would always talk about how short things would be in the league. And I'm telling you right now, I could cry through my glasses with how much blood, sweat, and tears were spent with the gentleman on the phone. And you know what? I'll tell you what. I would do it again every day of the week, three times on Sunday. Well, take your glasses off, so okay. that way you won't be able to see us no more. <laughs> then you won't talk no more. All right. There you go. CP, so, holla at us, bro. Chris. Hey, what's going on? What's going on, man? I um, he, he spoke on Joe Montana, how cool Joe was at the time when I got there. And uh, Joe, he came, he came to me. He said, hey, Rook, he said, I'm going to throw this ball to this spot. He said, the ball is supposed to be where it's supposed to be. He said, but if you're not there, you ain't gonna get in the game no more. So that's just how cool Joe was. He, he let you know, like he, he's not making mistakes. He's throwing the ball to where it's supposed to go. And uh, I mean, but he's so cool the way he put his hand around him and tell you, tell you all, those, all these things. So it's it was definitely a great time. Uh, all the guys on the screen, uh, we got, Hella stories with each one of them I could tell, uh, but I'm just proud to see. I, I get to see Tim a lot. Uh, I see Kimball when I travel. Sometimes he comes into town. See Donnell, uh, alumni weekend. Haven't seen Greg in a long time. And I just want to tell you, buddy, man, it's good to see you. I'm glad you're doing well. Yeah, Thank good you to so see much, you, G. This, so this is the most I've heard that Joe Montana said said a word. We talked to a lot of former players, and they said he just gave a look. He didn't say a lot. Greg and Chris Penn over here have a lot of stories of Joe oh, speaking no. out of Kennedy hey, flying. Greg, 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 Greg here. You're well, you not allowed to. Okay, okay. Well, you tell this story. Y'all remember the story where Joe Montana threw Marcus shoes, tied him up on the, on the uh, telephone wire for practice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All I was concerned about is Joe Montana had nice manicured fingers, man. So it was like <laughs> it wasn't rough. Well, it was underneath, you know what I mean? That was good. You know, Bones had them big knuckles. That wasn't very comfortable. So just... <laughs> uh, if, if only Joe's elbow would have lasted a little had been a little better manicured there in '93. Um, guys, we're talking about the '95 season here, kind of specifically and you know, we, we talked about what a season it was, record setting for the franchise, 13-3. and three, But it started off with just absolute – it was almost a team of destiny because you guys started off with just magical win after magical win. You go to overtime and to beat the Giants. You go to overtime and you beat the Raiders. And we were supposed to have uh, James Hasty here. He might try to hop on a little bit. He has this pick six against the Raiders to get you guys to 3-0. and oh, And it just seemed like uh, – Kimball, we'll go with you, man. Like It just seemed like a team of destiny – from the word go here in 95, man. Yeah, yeah, it, it had a special feeling to it. Uh, again, we had some we had some guys on our team, particularly up front. We had a, a great offensive line. We had the running back by committee. And I would say this about what we had in our room was so special. Like you said, we, was, we, were, we were not selfish amongst each other. We shared everything and uh, we genuinely cared about each other. That was the most important thing that I noticed about the Chiefs teams and organizations throughout the years. They really care about each other. and, and that made a big impact on how we played and how we wanted to show up. And I said this before, when you played for Marty Schottenheimer, you had a different type of feeling. 
you want to play for him because you want to make him proud of you. You want to win. You want to do things the right way. He took the, he took over the system where he made it just simple. I mean, and again, at that point, we was running the ball, ball a lot, so it made it a lot better on us up front. And, and uh, <clears throat> also in the passing game, we were able to pass the ball when we, when we needed to pass, and we set a physical tone on the side of the defense as they – obviously, I think that year they was number one, in, number one ranked defensive uh, – team in the league that year. I believe we came out that year uh, number one defense. So just all in all, we, we just had a great, great, great team to play with. And it was great. We had a great year on top of that. So um, unfortunately, it didn't end the way we wanted to. But uh, I felt over the years of being in Kansas City, winning is important. That just set the tone as even like now and where the Chiefs are now, they got a winning mindset. And when you start developing that mindset, anything can happen. Yeah, and Donnell, just talk about the start of that season for you. You mentioned you were on the pup list to start out there, but you're excited for your teammates, but I bet you're itching to get out there and help and just be a part of it. 100%, man. You know, Greg and I came in together, of course, so we would talk pretty frequently, and, and Greg is the most, as you could tell, competitive person you <laughs> ever – like, he wanted to take every rep, but he understood – you know, Marcus was the legend and Kimmel going to get his reps. And then after that, you know, he felt like nobody was supposed to touch the ball except him. So I'm I'm hurt. And I'm, you know, Greg is, is calling me, talking trash. And I'm like, bro, I got to get back out there, bro. And it and, and just like Kimball said, man, we we were super competitive, man. I, I think one of the things and I kind of pride myself on this. I, I, I've never said it to Kimball, but. You know, I would like to think that, you know, between me and T. Rich, we forced him to be a pro bowl because, like, we wanted to play. I'm not yeah. sitting here and say no, but Kimball stayed steadfast. He was consistent. He got better. He took his, his off seasons and, on purpose and, and got himself better. And, and once we got there and it got super competitive, not saying that the guys before us at fullback wasn't competitive, but – you know, he really pushed himself to be a pro bowler, you know, four or five years when we were all competing for the same football. So, you know, that that year, you know, I just wanted to get back out there and compete with those guys because, you know, Chris was starting to catch the ball some and getting yards and Lake and Greg. And I was itching, bro, to get back out there. So I was just working my butt off doing the rehab and doing what they were telling me to do so I can get back out there and be a part of it. Tim, as the wins started kind of piling up, you know, you guys, you know, open up with a win over the Seahawks. You, you know, you had this magical comeback against the Giants, which I believe was a 10-point comeback in the fourth quarter. The offense really hadn't done much all day, comes back, and you get a win in overtime. The Raiders is the next week. They come to Arrowhead, and it's uh, James Hasty's pick, pick six uh, to win that one. You go on the road and lose to Cleveland, but after that, it's – you know, the, this Chargers game uh, on Monday Night Football, one of the most electric environments I've ever been a part of. Tamaric Vanover's uh, punt return in overtime, a third overtime win in just the first six weeks. Did it start to feel like at this point, this is really something special brewing? Yeah, it did. I mean, it was a special team, like these guys said. It was very competitive. And now don't forget that, you know, Gunther Cunningham was the defensive coordinator. Mm -hmm. And every day in practice, it was competitive. You know, we would get out there and, and Gunther would challenge us on the offensive side and say, hey, listen, we're taking it to you today in the backs and the, and, and the wide receivers and the offensive line and the quarterback. You know, we'd have to stand up and we'd have to go ahead and battle against that. And, you know, and it was great for young guys like Greg and young guys like Donnell and Chris to, to, to go against a defense as competitive as they were. And, you know, Gunther was going to bring pressure. He was he was a competitive guy. He didn't want to lose any reps in a practice. So. You know, I always felt that practice was almost as hard as the game. We got into the Ooh. game. It was, a, we, you know, it was almost a break for us. And <laughs> and uh, so, you know, we would go in and we always felt like, you know, listen, the guys that we go against in practice, the Derek Thomases and the Dan Saliamuas and, and, uh, and you know, the Neil Smiths and the Tracy Simeons you know, and the James Hasties, those guys. Bro. He said James Hasty's in froze. <laughs> that's, that's all he need to say. Listen, I got, I got, I got a funny story. Uh, you there, Tim? Yeah, yeah. I, oh, was, go ahead. I lost you. But it was just competitive, man. Every practice was competitive, and you know we had to learn to go ahead and battle every practice. So when we got in the game, it was second nature. 
Donnell, did you have, Donnell, did you have a story yeah. here? Well, no. Nah, my rookie year, we were in training camp. I, I'm going to ask you if you remember this, Tim. We It was the goal line uh, scrimmage at the end of training camp. We did on that Thursday night when the family came over. And I had a horrible camp. Like, I, it, Kimball came to the room talking to me. Marcus came to the room. I was just struggling because, like G. Hill said, the playbook was this thick. And it was so much. So we had the goal line scrimmage, and I said to myself, either I'm going to make the team or I'm not. I, so I got in there, and it was 14 blasts. Everybody knew what the play play was going to be. And I went in and hit Tracy. Bop, hit him in the mouth. And I was <laughs> laying on the ground, sleep, unconscious sleep. And you <laughs> grabbed me and drug me back to the to the huddle. You remember that? Yeah. Yeah, I do. And drug me back to the huddle. I'm standing in there wobbling and everything. They like get him out of there, get him out of there. And that's when that that's when I knew I was gonna be all right. Well, you know, and and I knew and I knew how important it was to you, and I knew how important it was for you to be in there. So yeah, we just you know, we had to wake you up a little bit, we slapped you around a little bit, put a little smelly sauce in there. You were all right, you were ready to go again. Yeah, that was the way it was back then. You know, nowadays I gotta be out, you'd be out for three weeks. Oh yeah, definitely, (laughs) definitely. Well, let's take a quick trip down memory lane here. Clint talked about a couple games, the James Hasty interception return for a touchdown, and then the Van Over touchdown. I'll start with the James Hasty interception return. Of course, Marty always had a thing out to beat the Raiders. That was his main goal. We got to beat those pesky Raiders. And so James Hasty returns this interception for a touchdown for you guys to win the game. And then I'll get your comments on the other side. Here it is. There's going to be a big ball come out of here in a hurry. Alert our second there. Let's go. For the second straight week, Overtime proved to be a golden opportunity as a key free agent acquisition, James Hasty dramatically paid his first dividend. The blade intercepted, intercepted by James Hasty. He's at the 50, he's at the 40, Hasty at the 30, he's at the 15. Touchdown, 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 touchdown to win the game. James Hasty, 62 yards, intercepted return for a touchdown. Welcome to Kansas City, James Hasty. Kansas City wins in overtime. 62 yards, intercepted return for a touchdown. James nope. comes. James comes over from the Jets, makes his mark early in the season. What were some of your guys' thoughts and emotions as that plays unfolding, and he runs it back for a touchdown? Tim, we'll start with you. Well. Uh, I'll never forget that Tim Brown was complaining that the umpire blocked him and uh, that Hasty was able to make the play because uh, he, he he got uh, picked by the by the, the umpire and and, and, the, and the secondary there. But oh man, I, as you saw on that sideline, I was standing there, I was in shock. All of a sudden, here comes James Hasty barreling down the sideline, and I, as you notice, I stepped back and said, oh, my gosh, the last thing I want to do is get a penalty for being in the way. <laughs> I think it was it was, it was uh, Marcus and I both stepped back, and he just zipped by. It was a great feeling. And anytime you beat those damn Raiders, man, anytime you beat them, especially in overtime like that, and especially in a situation where my boy Tim Brown got picked and he was bitching and moaning and crying about it, no better way. <laughs> Uh, Greg, we saw your role become more. I mean, you rushed for 600 yards uh, in 1995. What was it like for you as, uh, you know, the, obviously, you know, the, the offensive coaches, Marty Schottenheimer, he believed in you. It seemed like in 94, Marty, he believed in you and he was able to look you in the eyes a couple times when, when there was a few mistakes or a fumble and say, hey, it's one play at a time. You know how Marty is. And Greg, you were able to take sort of your role to the next level here in 95 and you're a major part of this offense here. Well, you know, I was just, I was really just happy to get the ball uh, again. You know, you, you never really understand sometimes your circumstance until you actually can, you know, make peace with it and maybe kind of step back a little bit. Uh, you know, I was all about God darn it, give me the ball. If they give me the God darn ball, I'll get us the 100 yards we need. I'll put the ball in the end zone. We don't need to have all this other foolishness and stuff going on. Give me the damn ball, you know. And But the reality was, was like, when you got to the league, it was it was more than that. Yeah, it, it was it was it was about more than. Whereas <laughs> when I made that statement that I just made, that seemed like that was super selfish, and that was that was that was all Greg was about. But the reality was was I just wanted to help my team so much. I loved Kimball. I loved 
uh, Donnell. I love Tim. I love see like you really wanted to play uh -huh. for those guys on your team. I mean, you like Tim Grunhart said, like you really wanted they they created an atmosphere for success, an environment for thriving. It was like you wanted to do something that was big enough for that team that it would help you win a game. And the reality was it's just there just wasn't enough balls to go around. So when you got your opportunity, you had to try to make the best of everything that you were given because you knew that you weren't the only weapon that we had. We had weapons everywhere at every position. Truth be told, you could have bought in four or five different kinds of offensive coordinators. We had all of the talent that would have been necessary to run any and everybody else's offensive scheme. It was just who, who was going to get the ball, who was going to get the opportunity, and how many times would you get a chance to try and help your team. So I was, I was really about the team. And so whenever I got opportunities to do things, uh, I really didn't care about the accolades, but I really did care about that I got a chance to, I done, you know, Grunhardt up there blocking his tail off. And sometimes he was up there having the double team or having guys whip, try to whip his tail right in front of you. And like, that's your boy. You know, here's a situation. Kimball running in there. He's a big guy himself. Donnell, big guy himself. T, uh, T. Rich, big guy themselves. But, you know, you're running in there and the linebackers now, 6'4", 6'5", uh, might be 6'3", some of the guns starting at 250. Like, these grown men with three and four kids, a family, some responsibilities and bills. Like, people was laying in on the line. So you really wanted to do the best that you could with every opportunity you had. Yeah, and you mentioned playmakers all over the field, Greg. And Tamaric Vanover was one of those, especially that season for you guys. Had a 99-yard kickoff return touchdown against the Seahawks in week one. Did it again Christmas Eve against the, those same Seahawks. But we're going to go right now to his Monday night football return against the San Diego Chargers for you guys to win in overtime. And then I'll get your thoughts on the other side. Tamaric Vanover, that walking stick of dynamite, is waiting to light the fuse again. It'll be taken by Vanover at the 15. He's in trouble. Shed one jack. Trying to get to the other side. Kansas City has tied a record. Three overtime victories in a season. Rookie Tamarek Vanover's electrifying game breaker not only gave the Chiefs a record of 5-1, and one, it marked them as a force to be reckoned with in the NFL. Come on, come on. Man, <laughs> chill you there. there. What a good-looking guy you were, man. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> still good Bro, yeah, yeah, I remember. Oh, boy, that was a good-looking Greg Hill coming Kimber, in. Kimber, you here. remember uh, Vanover came in and was playing running back for two weeks? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Vio he came like, in there. He felt like he could do anything. Boy. Vanover was one of the special guys that he could just see stuff in lanes. But if he, I think if he lined up anywhere else on the football field, he might be pretty good at that area too. Vanover <laughs> was there for two weeks when he found out that he had the block. Like that. that linebacker <laughs> coming off the edge, drew the sale. Oh yeah, yeah. Vio said, "I'm gonna go. I'm gonna be the best kickoff returner <laughs> Kansas City that I ever had." <laughs> hey, I, I don't know about you guys. I'm raising my hand right now. I was so glad he ran that back. I was so tired. Oh, that yeah. That was, right. that was Bro, a long man. game. That was a long physical. Anytime you played those Chargers, man. Man, they, they were so tough. Physical. Yeah, you know, they, they that junior really say I was special. Oh, oh my man. goodness. Bro. Oh, my God. I remember I got the ball one time and, and broke outside, and I was like, I mean, I'd run 4-2, 4-3 with no problem. I mean, I was in good shape, 2-12. Looking strong, I broke. I remember I broke that ball outside, and I hit them brakes on him just so I could try to trip him up a little bit. He broke down with me. I kept going again. He broke down a second time with me. I said, "Well, hell, I'm about to get tackled." <laughs> I mean, like if, I literally in my mind said, "Oh, well, hell, I'm about to get tackled." <laughs> like he's not letting me go anywhere. He was six four, like two fifty. Oh, yeah. One was of the most best athletes you have oh, ever seen in your life. Oh, was that other some people. Now? I, yeah, I thought God made some people and not, like, not. forgot to be paying attention. You know, God, somebody might have called God and said, hey, while I'm sprinkling this guy with some talent, and then somebody called him and then he sprinkled this one guy with too much talent, and then the next guy came along, and now we see <laughs> him on the face of the earth, and this dude right here is ridiculously athletically talented. 
I wanted yeah. to be one of his children because I knew I would have had more than him. When you speak yeah. of uh, playing uh, divisional games, it's, it's always tough and tiring because Marty, he goes at it during the yeah. week. And we practice so hard during the week because he didn't want to lose those oh, divisional man. games. So yeah. when we're going to overtime, you play a long game like that, we were all gassed because it's uh, you were already yeah. beat down throughout the week because Marty, yeah. he, he, made, he drove it home yeah. that we were not to lose a divisional game. And that's the thing. that You guys went undefeated against the division that year, and that's – that's a time when you had five teams in the division. The Seahawks were there. You beat them twice. Raiders, Broncos. You go to Mile High for the second straight year and win there. Uh, Von Booker even scores a touchdown. We had him on last week in the second game. So you guys go undefeated against the division. Chris, you talked about the importance of that. And as this season rolled along, the division was uh, the Chiefs to take and you guys only. So the Chargers were coming off being in the Super Bowl the year before. The Raiders were picked to win the division. But you guys were picked six in a five-team division, and you go undefeated and win the thing at thirteen and three. Man, it's amazing, right? Yeah, yeah man, you know, that was. Always, yeah. Go ahead, Tim. Well, you know what we we always you know because of Marty, you know, obviously the Raider game was the game of the week, and then the AFC West games were the the other points of emphasis. I mean, we went in, we worked hard that week. We knew we had to win those divisional games. Uh, we knew that in order for us to have an opportunity to do what we wanted to do, we had to win those games, and, you know, we were able to do that. And I just want to reiterate once again, because I don't think Greg heard this in the beginning. You know, that running back room was so special. Uh, there, Like you said, there, there was a lot of guys with, you know, big egos and a lot of guys who, who had a lot of talent, but it worked. Uh, they loved each other. They, they, they complimented each other both on and off the field, and, and it was important to them. And that's why I mean, it, it, it trickled down. The leader of that team was Marcus Allen, and Marcus Allen was in that room. And, you know, he he kind of set the tone for all of us with his room, and then that's the way we were in the offensive line room. That's the way it was in the defensive line room. And we all just got along. It was special. There was a lot of love for your teammates, a lot of love for each other in, in, in that in that locker room. And it was special. And it should have been better. You know what? Uh, we all know what happened at the end. It should have been better. It was a shame. It was a travesty what happened because each one of these guys right here should have a ring or two on their fingers because yeah. those football teams deserved it. Those football <clears throat> teams did everything they possibly could to get themselves in the best position, and it just didn't work out. And that's a shame of it. Uh, but you know, bygones are bygones. But still, you know, there, there's a there's a ring around my heart for each one of these guys and how hard they work and how they dedicated themselves to being Kansas City Chiefs. And guess what? The foundation for this Chiefs kingdom was built by these guys right here in 1995. Mm. Mm. And and Tim, I 100 percent agree with you. I mean, the things we've done in the 90s uh, is very special and near and dear to my heart because. At the end of the day, we didn't win a championship, but we was champion heart, and that's the way we played. That's where we exhibit ourselves as as players, and and we just fell short. You know, it's unfortunate we fell short of doing that, but I know for a fact we did everything we possibly could to be a champion, and we had the mindset of a champion as well. And and you know, just even like now, the where the Chiefs are now, they have that mindset. So good things gonna happen. You just gotta keep keep pushing yourself forward. And uh, that's what I left with being in a league for 10 years, playing with one, one organization as well. So I um, always felt like a champion, even though we didn't win it. You know, on surface, we won in our heart, though. I believe that. Yeah, well said. And Chris, I kind of wanted to go to you. We've talked about the running back room, how close they were, how tight. And talk about the receiver room and where you were as a receiver coming into the 95 season, kind of where you felt that you were. Uh, in your development, in the pecking order there, of course, Webster Slaughter, Willie Davis, Lake Dawson. Uh, Tameric Vanover was even, even getting catches at receiver. They tried him at running back, but we'll try him at receiver. We'll see what he does here. So how do you feel like the receiver room was in your development in 1995, Chris? Uh, it was a it was a great time there. I uh, learned a lot. Um, I think the Chiefs, they didn't think I was ready. Uh, as the next year, 96, when I played, they were like, you know, we kind of held you back a year. Uh, you know, Marty told me, like, they kind of held me back a little bit. But we worked hard in practice. Like I said, we had a uh, number one defense. So my job was, uh, before it was special teams, a lot, uh, returning kicks, returning punts. But then we got to Merrick, who's just electric. So he came in. And like I said, we were all good good friends. Uh, I learned a lot uh, when they brought in Webster Slaughter. Uh, 
he helped me tremendously uh, getting off the press, uh, uh, how to shake and get off the press, how to run double move routes. That helped me a lot, uh, helped me in my career. Uh, like I said, me and Lake came in at the same time. We, we were real close buddies. Uh, Willie Davis was one of the dudes that just, I mean, talk about smooth. He's one of the smoothest guys out there. All, always clean, the car never dirty. You know, he, he, he kind of taught you the grown man stuff, at, you know, at, at growing up. So uh, it was a great competitive uh, uh, group of guys. Uh, we worked hard, uh, but we didn't have a choice to work hard. Everybody worked hard on the whole team. And so uh, yeah. our, our, our receiver coach, Al Saunders, he didn't uh, – I mean, we our practice was – I tell guys I ran more in practice than mostly anybody on the team because I'm offense, defense, uh, scout team, special teams, uh, hands team, this team, that team, whatever team, you know, you're on it. So uh, I got my work during, during the week, and uh, some games you get in and you're able to make a few catches. Uh, but, you know, it was real competitive. So 95 wasn't my breakout year, 96 was. But, I mean, I, you know, I feel like a big part of it because, you know, I, I know for a fact that uh, – Couple of guys that was on the, the defensive backfield uh, really came and congratulated me and a couple of other guys when they made the Pro Bowl because they said we made them work that hard in practice and made them even better. So, you know, that's that's, that's what you need in a in a total team. Uh, Greg talked about it about not being selfish, not speaking out, and I'm quiet by nature anyway. So I kind of wish I would have spoke out a little bit earlier. But how are you gonna speak out when your team is thirteen and three? You know, it's nothing to be said. You know, just play yeah. part and. Let it go. Let the chips fall where they may. Well, you guys, you guys head to the playoffs, uh, thirteen and three, like we mentioned, the number one seed. Only three losses uh, at Cleveland, which was actually the Browns team that wound up making the playoffs under Bill Belichick. Um, and then a loss at the Miami Dolphins on Monday Night Football, and a loss on Thanksgiving Day to the Dallas Cowboys in Dallas. So you guys go in thirteen and three, the number one record in the AFC, and the Colts kind of pull an upset, beating the Chargers in the wild card round. Or otherwise, it would have been a third game against San Diego. So coming into this Colts game, what's kind of the level of confidence, uh, Donnell, kind of starting with you, you would come back from your injury. You guys are going in a well-oiled machine at this point. What's kind of the, the mindset going into this uh, playoff game against the Colts? Well, we kind of knew it was going to be, you know, typical Kansas city weather. So it was going to be cold. So the, the game plan like usual was to run the ball and, and, you know, some play action passes here and there. And that was our plan. And we came out and that was the first time I, I ever practiced on grass with turf shoes on. Cause we, right. we couldn't even, we couldn't even wear cleats to practice that week. But anyway, um, and you know, we, we, we did a good job. The defense played their tails off like they always did. And, uh, you know, we, we fell short. We fell short, man. Hey, uh, real quick. Uh, you mentioned that Dallas uh, Thanksgiving Day game. Greg, I want you to admit now that I was the one who tackled that linebacker on the one-yard line when you tried to take credit for that. <laughs> <laughs> I chased him down, and I got him, and then all of a sudden you piled on and, and, then, and then you said you made the tackle. Do you remember you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I, 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 I 100% agree I with you. Down the field, 80 some yards. <laughs> I finally got him at the two yard line and caught the linebacker who's running four or five. Talk about that speed a little bit earlier there. Yeah, uh, I just slowed him down. That's all. He he just had his attention on me. That's all it was. He had his attention on me. You made the tackle. And, and then Mar Marty, Marty put it on the film and goes, Watch Grunhard right here. And then at the end, Greg's like, I made that tackle. I made that tackle. <laughs> and, and actually, the truth is, he did make the tackle. I, I like ran and I missed. I didn't know how to tackle. I was offensive center. I mean, so I just dove in there and Greg knocked him down over the top of me. But uh but getting getting to that that game, you know, that 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 was that was a shame because we were running the ball pretty effectively in the first half. And you know, for some reason the second half they decided we we're gonna throw the ball a little bit more and it just didn't work out. And I'll never forget Marcus Allen after that game. I've never seen anybody as mad and distraught. Yeah. If he yeah. was, I mean, I, he went in the equipment room, took his helmet and his shoulder pads off and was in the corner. I mean, he was as distraught as I've ever seen. I mean, it was concerning uh, how distraught he was and how upset he was. I think we all felt the same way. And, you know, we're not going to mention the name of the football player we named later who missed a couple field goals. We don't, we don't mention that name, but, uh, but listen, we, we really should have scored touchdowns. We got the red zone. It was us. We should have done that, but, That's a team. Uh, but you got, yeah, but you, you know, you, you got to make those chip shots. Whatever. You know, that's the way it was. So. 
Uh, well, Tim, we have some audio from Lynn Elliott. We did the kicker to be named later. I already messed it up. <laughs> <laughs> we have some audio. I don't know if you guys want to hear that from him a couple years ago uh, where he talked and kind of took us through what he saw, what happened. Is that okay if I play that for you guys? Is that is it still too soon? Uh, yeah, that's I, a I unanimous. Don't... You can skip that if you want to. You don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I can skip it. I can skip yeah. it. Man, you can play it, bro. Uh, no, ahead, we just joking. We joking. Yeah, go ahead. You can play it. <laughs> All right, here we go. It, it's two minutes, but we're I think joking, it's We're joking, but we're not. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> I'm here with a bunch of football players. I don't want to make the wrong move here. But, hey, before we do that, we've got Dave Zott joining us. Dave Ooh. Zott is in the house. Oh. Hey. What's up, gentlemen? What's up, bro? What's up, How we doing, guys? Tremendously blessed, man. How about yourself? Good I'm to doing see. very well. Very Zop well. Zop the tots. Zop the tots. Zop the tots. You know it, Greg. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, Dave, you came at the perfect time. We're right at the Colts playoff <laughs> game in 1995, and we're about to hear some audio from our interview with the kicker to be named later. <laughs> so if you're ready, I'm going to play this audio. <laughs> just say Wow. Talk, talk about timing and talk about life imitating art. Yes. <laughs> Woo! And here we go. Here's the kicker to be named later and his thoughts on what happened on that fateful night in 1995. Well, the game goes, the first kick was right before halftime. Uh, I don't remember what the score was. I assume we had seven points. I'm not for sure what it was. Uh, and on that kick, I mean, that was the direction that I'd want to kick. Uh and I went out there, and, you know, again, you're having to watch your footing, again, so you, know, so you don't slip and fall. Uh, and I went ahead and, and, you know, attacked the football and hit it, and I left it right off the rut, right upright. It might even have kissed the right upright. It was it was right there. Now, I didn't see that coming. I expected, you know, 100% to make that kick. Uh, and it was a real disappointment. It'd be like missing, you know, an extra point that they make you know, that, that we kick now, you know, I mean, it was a 35 yard field goal. I think it was 35 yards, somewhere right in that area. But I, I didn't have, uh, I mean, I chalked that up as, you know, snap, hold, kick, you know, we'll make it. I just left it right. And that really had nothing to do with anything other than the problem is, is once you miss a kick, then you're going to make some compensations. And, and as the game went on and I got the other two opportunities, remember, I, from the time that I kicked that ball, I did not see the field again until late in the fourth quarter. So probably in my mind, I'm thinking, hey, you know, be careful with your footing. Don't don't leave it off the right pole. And the last two kicks I left off the left side. So I don't know really what happened there. But, but my guess is, A, you're trying to make sure you don't slip and fall so you give yourself a chance. B, you know, the first kick you miss right, and next thing you know, the next kick you miss, you miss left. Uh, so when it was all said and done, that that was a that was tough on me. It was really tough on me. Uh, I feel like you should take the responsibility for your job. And when I went out to do my job, I didn't get it done. Uh, I didn't execute. Uh, so I have to take that responsibility. And I'll tell you this: Marcus Allen's a class act. Marcus Allen spoke with me. Marcus Allen treats me like, you know, like I'm a good friend of his uh, when he sees me. And I don't see him often. But when I do, I mean, hey, Lynn, you know, I mean, he's, a, he's, a, he's an excellent person and a great leader. So that's it from Lynn Elliott. His views on what happened. He went on in that interview uh, to say that he felt like a lot of the leaders didn't come up to him. He said he didn't know if they did that on purpose or they were just still in shock and they didn't feel like they needed to go up to him. Yeah. And so, Way to go, guys. Hey, I was still I, in I, shock. I, I want to hear from Dave. I, I want to hear what I want to hear what Zach had to say. <laughs> the look on his face says it all. Hey, well, guys, I, I'll say this. About, why, why do you need to have a friend at that moment? Like nobody has anything. Sometimes you know, my, my mom used to always tell me, if you don't have anything good to say, don't say nothing. <laughs> like the, uh, Jimmy Ray used to teach us this one. The least you say, the less you have to take back. Yeah. Y'all remember that one? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Dave, I want to hear that. Listen, listen. Yeah, Dave, know, let's go. There's plenty of plays that weren't made during the course of that game that would have made a difference. All right. Unfortunately, it goes down to a guy. And we've all th- had nightmares about this for the last 25 years. <laughs> Comes down to a guy that, you know, all his eyes are on him and we're all armchair quarterbacks. We're all armchair kickers. And, and he missed a couple kicks. Now, I haven't. 
watched this game film in a long time. I don't remember what happened, all the details of it, but I'm sure I missed some blocks and I'm sure, you know, we missed some tackles. Yeah. But I know this. We averaged 5.6 yards a carry. Okay. Marcus had 100 yards at halftime. At <laughs> halftime. Remember that? Yeah. Because my old nemesis and Grunny was rubbing it in all week, and you guys don't know this, but my my one loss in high school in my last two years of wrestling was to Tony Saragusa. Okay. <laughs> so here to all everybody. The whole world knows already because Grunny always talks about it. So <laughs> I lost to Tony my junior year. We won't talk about it. I was sick with Mono, but he beat me. He was a state champ. This is the first time I'm going to face him in a competitive environment, and I was salivating, salivating. <laughs> and, and Art Shell walked in, and he said before the game, he said, he's going over to scratches, like who's down. He said, Saragusa's is down. Sarah Goose is down, and he was their run stopper. And they had a good – I think they had a good, talented young guy inside, but he was young, and we were bopping him around, you know, with Will and Tim and whatever. We averaged we were we should have ran the ball seventy times that game. We were on twenty one and had and owned, had the ball for forty five minutes. I mean that's what it should have been. Yeah. So I'm not putting it on that. I mean I really it's just we all contributed, but you know that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> well said, Dave. Well said. <laughs> Very politically correct, Dave. That's why I love you. Hey, uh, <laughs> I do, I do remember the the Saragusa thing though, but I don't remember the mono part of it. I, the, the you had mono. That's I was sick. I was afterward. I, I was two hundred twelve pounds when I weighed in. Hold on, I, you weighed two hundred and thirty pounds playing guard in the NFL. You had to put weights in your pocket just to weigh in on, on Fridays. <laughs> Dave's not the only guy that actually put weights in his pocket to weigh in. All of us were trying to get under three hundred. He was trying to get over two forty. I used to actually hide it between my legs down in that little low spot. <laughs> that's another story for another time. <laughs> Next week uh, on four minute offense, the weights between. <laughs> oh my legs. goodness, bro. <laughs> uh, bro. Hey, Darnell. Listen, that, that core group. Darnell, this is Colgate football right here. Okay. Somewhere. All right. Where's, where's your son playing? At Bucknell. Oh, October 30th. Yes, sir. Hey, In the so mouth. You guys, I don't know if you guys know, but uh, Glenn Parker's kid is on Colgate, too. So, Glenn Parker, his son yeah. is a scrappy, tough son of a gun, plays tight end. Doug Marone's son's a freshman linebacker, just joined. And my son plays wide out. Your son's a running back? Yes, sir. Oh, we're going to bring the heat, Donnell. Bro, y'all better. <laughs> you better. Listen. <laughs> You know who my th my son think he is? He think he Greg here. He think he the fastest person on the planet. <laughs> he called me today and he's talking about that, that. Uh, it's a couple guys saying that the running back room ain't the fastest group on the team. And I I, I beat everybody. I'm like, bro, you, you got to call somebody else about that speed stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because you know? Bro, I don't know. Hey, listen, I was a Four six guy, but I'm gonna hit you in the mouth. I had good hands. I did have the best hands on this on this thread right now. Who? <laughs> what? I, I, I had the best hands on this thread right now. Those catches or something like you know? No, 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 no. That, that was a joke. That was a joke. <laughs> That's a good one. Oh, that was a good one. Yeah, yeah. You, you didn't think it was funny though, did you, Didi? That's funny. <laughs> we know you got a lot of jokes now. We know how you carried the room. You was the jokes in the room, so. Bro, listen, I'm just a real person. Like I, I'm gonna point out what's what's real and what's not. And that's all I do. It, and it come across funny sometimes, but I just I just shoot it straight. How it is, bro. Bro, y'all remember? Linebacker uh, from San Francisco knock knocked me out in the game. Y'all remember that? No, I remember that linebacker you knocked out in the game, though. When nah, the dude, dude the from, from, from San Francisco. Oh, I can't think of his name. Not the dude that played the Sam. Ro Romanowski? Not Romanowski. Absolutely not, bro. Don't ever say nothing <laughs> like that. The other dude, I can't. Gary Plummer. Yes. Oh, Gary Plummer. Bro, I'm trying to catch Will. We ran a, a toss. I was trying to catch Will. Get on this outside hip, bro. I was like, I ain't never gonna get that, so I might as well cut it up. I cut it up, and the linebacker was sitting right there, boop, sleep. And when I came to Greg, 
Campbell, Marcus, <laughs> T. Rich, all y'all standing on the sideline pointing at me back there. They holding my head up so I don't fall down with the smell of salt. Y'all laughing at me. <laughs> Hey, That's all right. One, one time, one time, time we, were, we were playing against Ted Washington, and Zoner thought it'd be a good idea to cut him on the backside of a slide. And Ted fell over the top of him, almost killed him because he was six foot eight, three fifty. And Ted got up, and he was Ted was so mad. And I had a play against him. I'm like Zoner, stop cutting Ted. Don't wake the sleeping bear. You remember that? And he, the next couple plays, he was picking people up and throwing them around like they're rag dolls. <laughs> Uh, and, and got him tired. Pick, and and I'm like, Zotter, stop cutting Big Ted and because he's just gonna get pissed off and he's gonna he's gonna hurt somebody. Ooh, beautiful, beautiful. I'm never that's cause, that's cause Big Ted had him by hundred pounds. <laughs> oh, he's a big man. Had everybody <laughs> by hundred pounds. <laughs> yes. Jumpy gathers, we went hurry up uh, with Jumpy <laughs> Gathers against Atlanta. And Jumpy was a specialist. He only came in on you know on pass down situations. So we caught him on the field. We go hurry up, and he's like, he always spoke in the first person. Don't do that to Jumpy. Come on, Jumpy needs his rest. <laughs> we kept hurrying up, and we're driving around. He's like, no, Jumpy, don't do that to Jumpy. Oh, and then, and then, then he put the they brought the pit the the uh, the uh, forklift. The, the forklift. He'd lift you up and he would carry you back to the back uh, quarterback and then throw you. He'd actually kill your feet would be in the air kicking like this. He'd be carrying. Mm -hmm. He was the only guy I've ever seen do that technique. He used to do hundred pound front and dumbbell raises, and he would just get his arms <laughs> under you and lift you up. He was like six, seven, six, eight, and he'd have you up on your toes and just forklift it, beep, 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 and you just <laughs> forklift you back in and throw you into the quarterback. It was so demoralizing. demoralizing. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, this is well, what was James Hasty was supposed to join us uh, tonight. Unfortunately, he couldn't make He's going to try and, and come here at some point. I'm not sure if he's going to be able to make it, but uh, it's going back to that 95 game, everyone's favorite topic, the playoff game. Uh, James <laughs> talked about. Derek Thomas going after Paul Hackett at halftime. He talked about at the end of the game, like you mentioned, Tim Marcus uh, was in the equipment room balling like a baby. He said also in that equipment room was James Hasty himself and Derek Thomas. He said those were the three guys in the equipment room balling like babies. And he's still not over it today. He feels like he can't come back to Kansas City. He let the city down. He doesn't feel just comfortable coming back here because that still weighs on him. Like, I want to know, like, where does this sit with you guys today? Like, how heavy of a burden is it on you? Have you been able to let it go? Because James hasn't, obviously. So, well, I guess I'll start. Um, yeah. Now we we had plenty more losses <laughs> in the playoffs. So, uh, you know, the Denver game in '97 wasn't much better. Uh, that was kind of a disappointing game too. Uh, you know what? You, you win some, you lose some. Uh, you know, when you look back on your career as a whole and you realize that you gave the best you possibly can and you made a lot of friends and you made a lot of family uh, with the, the, the players that, that you played with and you're proud of, of the product you put on the field. Uh, you know, heck, we all wish we would have won a ring, uh, but I think we did build, like I said a little bit earlier, the foundation for this kingdom, and, and that was built in the 90s, and this kingdom now is is growing and strong and, and, and doing great the foundation that we built. Absolutely. Kimball, where does that game kind of sit for you as we're here about 25, 26 years after the fact? I'm, I'm, I'm clearly over at, at this point, but I do recall that night, though, uh, and we talked about a little bit last week how it felt. It was probably one of the worst feelings at the time. And even, like you say, when the game was over, you go in the city and it looked like it was just the lights was off when, when nobody home. Ghost the city town. was just shut down. It was, it was it was the most eerie thing you can imagine in your life. And at that time, it was very disheartening. Uh, but obviously, you know, as time goes, you get over it. So I think right now I'm, I'm fine with it. Uh, it's part of history. It's part of something that you, you know, that, that's going to be part of your life for the rest of your life, you know. So, uh, so I get it. So I'm good like, with it right now. Donnell? Yeah, you know, it was a lot of lessons learned in that. I mean, um, it was a tough loss, just like everybody said, obviously. But, you know, um, Jimmy Ray used to say all the time, sometimes you're the net and sometimes you're the windshield. The key is to be the windshield more times than you are the net. And 
after that game, like Kim would say, everybody was numb and you were trying to piece it together and put it together. But, you know, we also had the 12 o'clock rule. And when, when it was the next day, you know, we had to move forward. We had to get ready for what was to come next and, and all that stuff. But you, you think about it, just like you think about the good times, you also think about the bad times as well and maybe what you could have done differently or, or what could have been if, if something would have happened differently. But, you know, that's a part of it. That's a part of it. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Yeah, you said you guys had the 12-hour rule. Uh, for James, he thought that maybe that carried over into you guys in 1996, that loss. Um, he, talking about how it wasn't as successful as 1995. But we also – we had Steve Bono on last week for our Marty party. We talked about his 76-yard touchdown run uh, that he had against the Cardinals with Joe Valerio pulling out in front of him with nobody to block. But we actually caught up with Steve Bono several years ago. I want to get his audio here on uh, the 1995 Colts playoff game. He feels like he went in with the wrong – mentality the wrong mindset and uh, he still says he looks in the mirror and puts a lot of blame on himself so this is shorter audio than Lynn Elliott but I'm going to go to that right now unfortunately it ended uh, in a in a way that uh, obviously none of us wanted um, for sure the big sure you know big, my you biggest know, my biggest uh, regret um, you know in, in hindsight uh, I hadn't uh, I hadn't approached it m mentally correctly. Um, you know, felt like I, I was the one that needed to make the plays and, and I, and in hindsight, I, I didn't, I just needed to get the ball to the open guy. Um, you know, wish, wish that I had another opportunity to play in a playoff game. Uh, I think it would have been better for it, but, uh, again, it is, it is what it is looking back on it. Um, but like I said, probably the the sweetest and the most sour uh, tastes um, in of uh, of my career in uh, in one season. You know, wasn't wasn't supposed to be that way, and uh, it's just, it's a you know again just very unfortunate. Um, you know, like I said, it's uh, I I I. I blame myself. I look at myself in the mirror and blame myself. So, uh, I, I can, you know, I, I live with it and, uh, you know, move, move on. So Tim, you heard him there. Talk a little bit about, uh, kind of his mindset and thinking how he felt he needed to make plays and he wish wishes that he could go back and just know that he just needs to hit the open man when called upon and not try to force the ball and make the big play for you guys. Yeah, I mean, everybody's disappointed with the play. I mean, I, like Zotter said, I'm sure there was some blocks that we missed. Uh, there was some, you know, runs that maybe weren't as successful as they could have been, some passes. It's just the nature of the beast. And, and uh, you know, we, we should have scored and we got in the red zone and not put it in the hands or in the foot of a kicker. Uh, but that, that's just part of it. And we did learn, like Don all said, we learned some lessons and we went on right. and you know, football is a microcosm of life. You're not going to get everything that you want. You're going to have those games and those days that you fail. And how do you react? How do you bounce back? Uh, you know, how do you uh, convert on those fourth down situations yeah, in life and in the games? And that's what we did. So, uh, you know, uh, I look back at my career and my, my time, my 11 years at Kansas City Chiefs and the friends and, and the family and, and the people that I met. Um, you know, not getting a ring was certainly a disappointment. And I think 95 was one of our best chances, but it certainly doesn't throw a shadow on uh, my career or my love for the guys and, and the Kansas City Chiefs. Absolutely. And Greg, going you, you're running back there, obviously, there in 95 in that playoff game. What were you thinking seeing uh, in the second half? We talked about the ball kind of flying around the yard and the interceptions start piling up. Uh, it actually looked like it should have been four interceptions, not the three that Steve threw. Ashley Ambrose had one in the corner of the end zone uh, that if there was instant replay back then, that would have counted as well. Just what did you think as a running back having the success in the first half running the ball and then seeing the interceptions in the second half? Well, obviously, I would have had a problem with it. You know, we, <clears throat> being a running back, we always felt like, uh, I mean, literally, if we could have, be, because of the offensive line that we had, because of, of our mentality and having had games where we kind of felt like that we would, we physically would impose and uh, impose our will upon people that we were playing. Uh, me and Donnell had gotten to the point to where, uh, Kimball, Marcus, no matter who was in there, T. Rich or whatever, 
We embrace the three, four yard run. We in, we we love being able to hit you square off in the mouth, no fair dodging. You know, give it to us as much as we can. But we also understand that you know a time constraint is always involved when you're running the ball if we're not breaking big big runs or whatever. So to be able to run well in the first half and then go into the second half and throw the ball so much, I mean, you know, it's a it's a something like that. You'd have to be pissed off at the uh, offensive coordinator, which obviously did happen. And, you know, there were some things that were probably said after a game or thought after a game uh, from an offensive uh, strategy standpoint that, you know, probably should have been different. But the reality is this. There were a bunch of games that we played where we felt like we should have run the ball more. There were a bunch of games that we played that we felt like that there was more confidence with us running the ball. We had weapons at every every position, but the reality was still the same, you know, we weren't calling the plays, uh, you know, offensive coordinator, that was his responsibility. And if he didn't see that that was what was necessary in order for us to uh, win a game, I mean, we had to go along with what, what, what the plan was. And, uh, you know, and, and the turnout ended up being what it was. Yeah, and uh, Dave, I kind of want to get your thoughts on this, the second half strategy, throwing the ball you talked about a little bit. But uh, something we haven't mentioned here, if people watching or some people kind of forget or don't know, uh, Steve Bono was the 1995 AFC Player of the Year, uh, and so heading into that, he had had a strong season. You guys went 13 and three, uh, but like you mentioned, you had success in the first half running the ball, and then the second half, uh, I guess the mentality wasn't there for Steve, thinking he needed to make plays, and uh, unfortunately, the interceptions happened. Yeah, I mean, uh, I tried looking it up. The stats. Do we have the running stats on that game? Because I, I remember us, you know. Obviously, pretty strong and pretty dominant. I remember 5.6 yards of carry. I think it might have been at halftime, but that's been grained in my head for a long time. Yeah. I'll say this. I'll say this. I feel better now with this group as we're vetting out these old emotions. This is like a therapy group, okay? Absolutely. <laughs> so I'm glad I'm able to join. It's a state place. Did I not tell you this is what this is, Dave? This is our therapy group. <laughs> Today, Tonight it is for me. I'll tell you that. So. <laughs> yeah, we've all we've all had some emotions we've held for a long time. And and what I look back in and over our careers, my career is the missed opportunities we had, right? That was probably the best football team I was ever a part of. I was part of a national championship in co in college, thankfully, and I was part of some other in another 13 and 3 team and some 12 and 4s. We had a lot of success there. But that football team, that defense that group that ran that was a special special group and you know dale on one side james on the other i mean we had some dudes out there and and that's what i just i the missed opportunities because you once you lose and the tears are shed in the locker room there is no tomorrow and and you got to try to rebuild that team and no team we tried to keep that team together but the chemistry wasn't the same in 96. And it's just the way it goes. And when you get that magic element in the bottle, and if you could bottle it and find out what it is, we'll all be rich, right? <laughs> um, but it's just that chemistry that comes together from this rookie, you know, that all of a sudden pops up and makes a play and some vet and a new coach. And school, all those things come together at the right time, and you had magic. And, and we just fell short with the potential of that team. Um, and that's why Marcus hugged me, and I remember crying on my shoulder. He's like, you don't understand. And we were in year six, Tim, right? We didn't know we'd play longer. But you don't know you got tomorrow. And that's what you, you yes. look back at, almost 54 now, and you look back and, God, that was a good football team. And we were good enough to go to distance. And, and I've been around football a long time, and that was a special group. And it's so hard to put those pieces together especially losing Joe Montana from 94 going into 95. And I, there was one publication that they said, pick you guys sixth place in a five team division going into 95 because of the loss of Joe Montana. And here you guys are 13 and three. It was really a magical season. Of course, it didn't end the way that we wanted, but I mean, people still look back on that fondly, that team and that opportunity that you guys had. And uh, that's what you guys had under Marty Schottenheimer, great opportunities to go into the playoffs and let the chips fall where they may. And unfortunately, they didn't fall uh, to where we were winning Super Bowls. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Well, guys, I tell you what, it has been such a pleasure doing this. The 95 team was such a part of my life. Growing up as a Chiefs fan, Noah and I both, you know, that, that was the first season I really remember watching all the way through and being so much so invested. And 
Uh, this has brought back some great memories. All of you guys played a big role in, in no and I's lives to, to get to where we are in, in sports media. So you all have played a role in that. And it's been so awesome catching up with all of you. And I'm so glad you guys had the opportunity to talk with each other and, and kind of hash it out here. This is so awesome. No, nothing like this has ever happened before. So. Well, I appreciate the guy opportunity, guys. Great seeing all you, Kimberly. All right, Sam. Greg, see you guys. Right. It's fantastic. G, I'm gonna call, I'm gonna call you, G. Yeah, yeah. Please do. I love <laughs> you. Good to see all y'all. Good to see all y'all, man. Love you guys. <laughs>